Here's a shout out to our latest patrons on Patreon. Thank you so much for your support. Your help gives us a chance to just create more great content for you to listen to. Laura Higgins, Erin, Elise Galbraith, Jason Higginbottom, Meeks, Natalie Lane, Taylor Keat, Elizabeth Campbell, Bridget Walkerson, Blair, Jason Gillick, Diane Hughes, Paul, Victoria Brook, Rebecca Rowlings, Kirsten Reichert. Sorry if I am pronouncing these incorrectly, but it doesn't mean I don't love you any less. Emily Lancashire, Jeremy Laidlaw, Kath Goslett and Robert McKinnon. Please be advised this podcast contains descriptions of graphic violence and it's not appropriate for children. This is Australian True Crime with Emily Webb and guest co-host, crime writer Vicky Petratus. Come with us as we go beyond the news cycle to find out how people become killers, how people become victims and what happens next. Dandenong raised Mahmoud Fazal is a university educated former member of an outlaw motorcycle club. He has a unique perspective from the inside. Now as a journalist, Mahmoud is exploring the fascination with violence and the real cost of this obsession. I think there's a mystique around motorcycle clubs and particularly outlaw motorcycle clubs that the public are curious about. Can you explain to us, I don't know if there's a hierarchy with clubs or what is an outlaw motorcycle club? You have had ties with the Mongols. Are they a big club in Australia? Yeah, they are one of the biggest clubs. At the time, I originally joined the Finks Motorcycle Club and we were the first club in Australia to be declared a criminal organisation and we appealed it in the High Court. Won that appeal, but then Abbott threw another million dollars at the opposing forces and we couldn't fight that. This was all about the consorting. So if, like, I was mates with you and I'm not in the Mongols, but I'm, like, having a coffee with you. They were called the Vlad Laws, yeah, where if more than two members were seen in public, they would be sent to prison. So three or more members consorting, which is consorting to commit crime it got to the point where it was if they were just getting a beer out in a pub they would go straight to prison that's without court it's like getting a fine it's a really draconian law and we were the first club to be slapped with it but we also took it to court and we couldn't fight the appeal purely because we didn't have the funds i mean blokes were putting their houses up everybody sold their bikes in queensland at one point to really you know fight the system but it all broke down and as a result a way to bypass those laws and to um, bypass the fact that we weren't allowed to exist as the Finks Motorcycle Club in the state of Queensland. We patched over to a club called the Mongols, who are one of the most notorious motorcycle clubs in the world. They started just after the Hells Angels in the 70s. They were started by Mexican and Latino veterans in the United States returning from the war because the Hells Angels only accepted white members. So they started this club to rival them called the Mongols and they had a pretty bloody war for that SoCal patch. I mean, I know about SoCal because I watch Sons of Anarchy and I know that's fictional, but I think some of it would have been based on reality. Not really. No. <laughs> you just shattered my, uh, my perception. Look, I did... I think I was like a lot of people who thought they were getting an insight into outlaw motorcycle gangs. But, I mean, Australia has had a history with outlaw motorcycle gangs and there was the Milpara Massacre. Mm. I think the Hells Angels in Australia and New Zealand were the first chapters exported out of California. I think it was actually New Zealand, then Hells Angels London, and then it slowly spread. But Australia's had its own clubs for a very long time as well. There's some very old Australian clubs. I'm not an outlaw historian. Maybe like the Coffin Cheaters and the Finks especially. The Finks have been around since the 70s and we had some pretty diehard old school, real deal outlaw bikies. But yeah, that's all changed now. So tell us about how you came to be part of a motorcycle club, outlaw one in particular. I was um, just running around the wrong neighborhoods yeah how old were you probably 21 yeah and i was probably mixing with the wrong people i had may have developed a bit of a reputation for myself and some people i knew in prison got patched into the finks at the time 
motorcycle clubs were competing for power and they were patching in Middle Easterners. It was revolutionary in a cultural respect because outlaw clubs for a long time were seen as very white, Anglo, you know, swastika wearing counterculture movements or whatever. But towards the late 90s, early 2000s, it began to shift in Sydney especially. And then around 2010 onwards, it happened in Melbourne where, yeah, Middle Easterners were being patched in. What was happening in your life at the time or what attracted you to get involved? I just went down there. I knew people from other outlaw motorcycle clubs growing up, but we never wanted to become part of what they were doing. So what did you think they were doing? Like what wasn't attractive before you decided to join? Well, I'd visited clubs. I'd been at the Hells Angels clubhouse in Thomastown and I'd visited like other motorcycle clubs, two or three other motorcycle clubhouses at the time. And they just didn't seem to be like us, you know, Arabs from um, the southeast suburbs. We didn't fit their identity, you know. A lot of these guys, big bearded, fat bellied, Aussie dudes who listen to rock and roll. It wasn't us. We were listening to Tupac and, you know, we like driving souped up cars and Mercs and shit like that. And these guys were into these weird shovel heads and old motorcycles and we didn't get it. Um, we like Japanese motorcycles, to be honest, at the time, or like Ducatis and shit like that. When I was introduced to the Finks, it was just a bit different. They were a bit more, when you rolled up to the gates, it was like very organised, very militant. And the guys at the club were more aligned to us from an identity perspective. They were rocking Nike TNs and shocks and wearing big gold chains. And there was like Maseratis in the car park. So we thought, fuck, you know, this is this is glamorous to us. It's like street fame glamour, you know. They had diamond Rolexes and, yeah, we were just into that sort of shit. Yeah, we were into the aesthetics of it all. You know, they had probably... Two dozen strippers at the clubhouse, you know. In our eyes, when you come from an area like Dandenong, that's the life. And you're a young guy. You're a and young you're... guy, you've been listening to rap music, you know, you've been um, brainwashed into thinking that making it is aligned to a lifestyle of excess and we thought we found it and so I wanted to cash my chips in. And were you looking for a sense of belonging, particularly at that time? I wasn't looking for a sense of belonging. I had boys. We had a crew. We were pretty connected in our own area. We didn't really need to belong to them. But I think we were looking for an identity as young Muslim migrants. We felt othered by society. I think at the time, outlaw bikies were like also othered by society, but they were like the poster child of counterculture and antisocial behaviour, and that's that's what we wanted to do. We wanted to be anarchists in the most revolting way, and the media taught us that these guys were the best at it, so we thought, fuck it, why not? For a gang that probably is made up of anarchists, of people that are anti-law, what kind of rules did you have to obey as part of the club? Yeah, well, I was a meth addict before I joined the club, and that got beaten out of me very quickly yeah when you prospect for a club all the stuff you read in the news is bullshit ice is strictly prohibited you can't have anything to do with it and if you do get caught out there are very severe repercussions it wasn't difficult to come off because I think I needed that sort of regimented tyranny in my life which I hadn't had I had very loving parents who let me do and get away with a lot so and suddenly you're bound to this code and you know and you've seen how severe the repercussions can be. You uh, straighten yourself out pretty quick, smart. Also because you want to earn that patch, so you want to prove to certain people that you got what it takes. A lot of the guys that have done really well in outlaw motorcycle clubs that have earned their stripes, been there for a long time, they don't even drink. It's interesting. It's like an enforced rehab. I guess the perception is that it'd be like a free-for-all. But to be very clear, this is strictly with 
the Finks at that time in Melbourne. I'm not talking on behalf of every other club. I'm not a representative of Outlaw Motorcycle Clubs or anything like that. It was just our chapter, our club at that specific time was like that. There were other clubs where other shit was going on, where maybe they were doing things like that. It was a bit more gung-ho. What other rules did they have? Because I've heard that some of the clubs could have quite strict rules. So no drugs. What else weren't you allowed to do? It depends. There's a lot of rules. The rules are kind of aligned with street culture and where we came from. So it wasn't like we were taking on all these new rules. Those rules are second nature to anyone who's been running around and making moves in the street. You don't talk to police, obviously. You don't abide by any authorities. The Finks was an interesting club because it didn't really have a hierarchy. It's the only club in Australia that hasn't had a hierarchy. There was just one sergeant at arms there wasn't a treasurer there wasn't a president vice president there was only a sergeant at arms of every chapter and his role was by and large to make sure everything was going all right not telling people what to do but this was the old finks there's a new finks now as well i have nothing to do with and i don't know how they do things but the old finks before they patched over to the mongols that's what it was like so how long were you involved or like in that scene Oh, probably I guess six years or something, yeah. What impact did it have on your life? I know that you've, you're now a journalist and you're working for Vice and you're doing really interesting exploration about violence as a what meaning does it have for people. Did your experience push you into doing all that? Yeah, I think the club has a lot of benefits in certain respects, but some people can go into it and take advantage of it and, and can be manipulated by it. It just depends what your purpose is within a club. If you go to a club to make money, you might find yourself in very sticky situations. But, you know, if you genuinely love motorcycles and are there for brotherhood and just want to fuck the system off, you could have a really good time and never cop a charge or a conviction in your life. There's dudes in the club that are like that, in every club that are like that. They just have a love for this 1% of spirit of just being on the outliers of society and having this community where you can just do whatever the fuck you want on a Friday night and burn rubber and ride around with a pack of guys who are one percenters. Yeah, it's very freeing. But a lot of the things that happened in my life that resulted in me not being part of the club had nothing to do with the club. There was a lot of violence that I was involved in and that my connections were involved in, yeah, and so uh, I lost a few friends in the space of a couple of years and I ended up leaving the club, but I, I'd been an office bearer in the club for a lot of years, so I, I'd gained respect and I'd put in for the club and it was all done very respectfully, yeah. Is it a matter of your values no longer align with theirs or your values change or what is the leaving moment? You don't really leave a club. You're often kicked out of one unless you have some extreme circumstances. I had some pretty extreme circumstances, so it was all done pretty respectfully. I, you know, I buried a very close friend of mine and multiple other friends in the space of two years, so they gave me a bit of a break. I don't think it's a question of my values are now better than theirs because I'm, you know... Not working. better, just different, you know, or just shifted. I guess when I was at the club, I was in a state of mind that I thought I understood violence and I thought there was a place for violence and I thought violence could get results. I didn't like the way society worked largely because I couldn't get a job when I completed university. So I was just pissed off and then it was kind of like a confirmation bias. The things that worked for me were largely criminal elements and criminals and they're the people that made sense to me. So it was just a series of things that confirmed these outlaw ideas in my head and I thought I understood the way people like me were treated by society and the way that we should behave as a retaliation or reaction to the way we're treated by society and that's just commit violence, make money by any means necessary and you quickly realise that there's other repercussions for things like that and it's not the law all the time. I've got many friends in prison at one stage, I had more friends in prison than on the outside. You know, I've got cousins doing 15-year to 20-year sentences who were incarcerated at the age of, say, 22. But it's the other things. It's within that world, there's a lot of jealousy, greed. You stand over people. Maybe five years later, they'll come back to your house and let off shots. And you've got to constantly be watching your back and things like that. And 
yeah, in my head it was all just a game until you reach a certain level and people start getting shot. Did you have a particular tipping point that you said, this isn't working anymore? It wasn't like the club, this isn't working. It was like that lifestyle yeah, is not yeah. working for me. Yeah, I buried my best friend. Yeah, he was shot in the face. Yeah, it wasn't it wasn't good. I mean, you know, you go into his house and his mum's asking you, you know, to give her answers. And because I was a high-ranking bikey at the time, I was suspected of being involved or something, I don't know. And then other people that I knew were getting murdered. And this is all in Melbourne. Like, it's all on the record. It's been written about and multiple people that I knew died in rapid succession. And maybe I lost my balls and I I, I, think I you retreated. wisdom. <laughs> yeah, Thank you, you've got a unique yeah. position. I mean, I'm very aware as we're talking, we're two white women going on. The club I'm in going is a good club. <laughs> yeah, and I'm so, like, oh, yeah, I watch yeah. Sons of Anarchy and as if that's even any, I like, didn't even watch that. It is interesting. It's Melbourne and the experience of, you know, we are a very multicultural city, but there's experiences people have and they are not given the same opportunities as if you grow up in the eastern suburbs and you're white and you go to, I don't know, some private school or something. I think you're in a really unique position where you've, got that insight into what it's like we talk a lot about male violence and young youth offenders and you know and I always get the sense and the belief that it's because of feeling alienated from society and you said you couldn't get a job when you finished uni what were you studying at the time I went to um, art school I studied film prior to all that stuff I was really well educated I had very privileged upbringing my dad sacrificed a lot to um give us the best possible education and I did quite well. I had the cliche story. I had a couple of teachers that really inspired me to read books. Even when I joined the Outlaw Motorcycle Club, I was always reading. Yeah, I was an obsessive reader. What do you read? Oh, I read everything. Yeah. Back then, the first book he introduced me to was Dostoevsky's House of the Dead, which is about Dostoevsky's time in prison, in a Siberian prison camp. And then I just, I'd read anything, but along that line, like I love Celine's writing Journey to the End of the Night. I love Proust. I love everything. Yeah, I'll read whatever. Amy Cazare's poetry, Kolosowski, Blanchot. I loved Foucault, obviously, especially his writing about the prison system. I guess that's another reason why I was able to climb the ranks because I read and a lot of these guys haven't had tertiary education. They just assumed that I had this edge. It's like knowledge is power and it allows you to move, you know. Yeah. Move, navigate different situations, you know. So you studied psychology? Yeah, that was towards when I was wrapping up with the club. Did that yeah. give you any insight into violence, now that you're looking at violence and the meaning of violence and and how violence occurs in our society through your podcasts? Did your psychology studies start that journey or had you already started thinking about that? I think I'd already started thinking about that. The psychology degree just helped me make sense of ideas and how rigorous scientific research is and how um, how critical you have to be of ideas and arguments and things like that. I think that was the biggest takeaway I got from it. And a lot of these broad generalizations that I'd made about society and the way I was being treated or I thought I was being treated weren't actually true or backed up by research when you did psych studies. It was just me just confirming my ideas by getting involved in crime when I probably shouldn't have. But yeah, I think my main purpose for it was to somehow, for writing all this stuff and getting involved in the podcast was to, in a way, give people that experience where my work seems as though it's romanticising a culture that's actually quite shocking. And, you know, all the Rolexes and, you know, having all these women in nightclubs in your booth and, you know, carrying 10 grand with you everywhere you go. It's all of like a fucking mirage because one day, you know, you will get whisked away. If you're enjoying this episode, you might like episode 24, Australian Gangs, Yesterday, Today and Tomorrow with Susanna Lopez. You'll find a link to that episode in our show notes. After the break. Mahmood talks about capitalism and outlaw motorcycle clubs today. Coming up on Australian True Crime. What's a woman's place in the world of an outlaw motorcycle club? And Mahmood makes sense of violence through his own podcast, Violent Times. It's a cliche story. I mean, I grew up watching gangster films, but I never 
realize that it's not a cliche, it's the truth. You're just gonna wind up in prison or get shot at. And for some people, when they get shot at, they think they can go two ways, they get even more reckless or, you know, they straighten themselves out. But when it happens multiple times, yeah, I kind of just wanted people to somehow feel that shock that this isn't just a rap song. Like you think motorcycle culture and gang culture is cool, but it's only applauded by people who come from Turak and think it's sexy or something. But people actually doing it are from commission housing who have no hope, who haven't had the opportunities that even someone like myself has had. And it's easy to just paint them with a brush and say, he didn't have to slang heroin when he was 12, when actually his mother was a sex worker and his dad left him in a commission housing and there's all these other mitigating circumstances that people aren't willing to understand. So I like to humanise people that have committed quite atrocious crimes because there's always more to a story, I think. And that's what we talk about a lot on this podcast. We talk about the ripple effect. So it's not just what happens, it's what happens after and talking a lot about the impact on people, families of perpetrators, you know, friends of victims, all that kind of stuff. And I think you're right. You know, we sometimes get called, oh, you're bleeding hearts or you're crazy feminist because I just feel like you've got to look at the broader picture. I'm interested about the perception and the reality you've described about What are women's places in this world? Have you sort of changed your view about women or? Oh, yeah, of course. So what's a woman's place in the world of an outlaw motorcycle club? They don't really exist. Sometimes I have like family nights where everyone brings their partners in and everybody eagerly calls up the treasurer to let him know not to call the strippers in that night. Just because they don't exist in our environment doesn't mean there's no respect. There's a lot of respect for women in outlaw motorcycle clubs in a very old school kind of way. I mean, I've seen people get their heads caved in. On a Friday night, they've made a passing comment to someone's partner and they've got absolutely destroyed in that sense. Especially a lot of the high-ranking members, they try to teach the young guys how to change their attitudes towards women. A lot of these guys spend a lot of time in prison They haven't had relationships in the way we might have on the outside. You know, a lot of them have only had sexual relationships via sex workers. They haven't had intimate relationships in a kind of natural way that others might have. So their thoughts might seem deranged, but it's because of the way they were nurtured, I think, to speak to women. I mean, by and large, they treat women with the utmost respect, but there is obviously a problem, and that problem is often explained by their upbringing. They've seen domestic violence in their homes a lot of the time, and sadly, they don't know how to engage with the opposite sex. How did you get involved with Vice, and how did you end up doing the podcast? It's a bit of a long story how I got involved in Vice, but I basically I pitched a documentary that I was planning to make in the um, southeastern suburbs. It was about a bunch of young Muslims who were being radicalised. But then there was a series of raids where all those guys got incarcerated, so it killed the video right. the documentary piece. And then I wrote the story for Vice, and they printed it and gave me a column. And then from there, I just started pitching ideas and I pitched this idea about violence to try and make sense of violence in my own head by speaking to people who had been affected by it. Everybody's relationship to violence is different and that's why I'm always interested in how people define violence and how they make sense of it and whether they think it's necessary and when do they think it's necessary and at what point would they excuse it? Would they excuse it when someone's standing in their daughter's bedroom at 3am or do they excuse it systematically, like in the sense of Indigenous incarceration? Like at what point do we need to engage with it? Those sorts of ideas. What patterns are you finding? Because I know as a crime writer, when we interview person after person after person, you start to see patterns and you start to learn about your world in all of the people that you're interviewing from, I think it was an SAS guy and then the Japanese I've got to say it right, Yakuza. What patterns are you seeing? What new knowledge are you kind of going, oh, wow. Every time I think I've got a pattern and I've worked out a string, it's so slippery. There are are way too many factors to find a clear thread. With Outlaw Motorcycle Clubs, it felt more like it was about maintaining order, discipline, and a sense of outlaw enforcement or something. With the military, they were defending the country, honour, 
And it's the same thing, order, discipline, isn't it? Yeah, and but I think it's counterintuitive for outlaw motorcycle gangs that order, which seems to be the very thing that you're escaping from, ends up being a core belief. Mm. Yeah, maybe that's a pattern. Yeah, I think that's because the military and outlaw motorcycle clubs are interconnected because the culture springs from the military. So a lot of those ideas are entrenched in the fabric of outlaw motorcycle clubs, but not anymore. I mean, if you look at the way some clubs are operating today, they're just like transnational crime syndicates. They've got nothing to do with outlaw motorcycle culture at all. They don't even ride bikes, do they, a lot of them? No, they don't. But the executions and the money, everything is so, so much more brazen that there's no more countercultural element to it. It's purely capitalism, which is everything that the scene was born against. Yeah. Has anything really surprised you on your journey with doing this podcast? Has there been a moment that's really stood out to you that uh, shocked you or has profoundly affected you? There was a moment when I was with a team. They were from the second commando regiment and just the atmosphere in a room full of men who have killed multiple people. I don't know, the not a spiritual person, but you do feel something, a heightened tension. And the only time I'd ever felt that before was when I was visiting a Kasia unit in Bowen Prison, which is the most supermax prison in Victoria. And you've got to go through three checkpoints to just visit someone. And even then you're visiting them through reinforced glass and it's all recorded. But that was interesting that I'd only felt that atmosphere of heightened violence and death at those two moments. That was pretty shocking to me. And how openly commandos talk about PTSD and how they suffer from it and the sacrifice, I guess, they make to themselves. Is that something that outlaw motorcycle gang members suffer from, considering that you have violence and friends dying? Is that, and you witness a lot of that, Mm. is that prevalent in gangs? Yeah, it's different because no one talks about it. There are suicides that happen in outlaw motorcycle clubs, but no one talks about mental health in outlaw motorcycle clubs because it's kind of assumed it comes with the territory. You have to be a little bit unhinged to get involved in a life like that. But for the most part, the club is your escape. It's your Prozac. It gives you a moment to breathe when you're on the road with these guys that you really care and admire. But um. But it's never spoken about because I guess you're in a very macho, masculine environment that exercises bravado a lot of the time. You want to look tough. You don't want to look like you've got problems, even though people were brazenly eating Xanax and Prozac and Seracol so and high doses. So medicating No, no. You, they were prescribed. Oh, yeah, right. It's very hard to get Seracol on the street. Yeah. Doctor's got to give you that. I'm remembering um, we did an episode with a guy called James Harding who was, you know, a hard man, a bit of a standover man. Well, he was a standover man. And he just hit that point where he's like, I cannot do this anymore. And he now works with men. He's got a thing called Hard Cuddles and it's actually working with men. Talking about stuff that you were describing because he said when they were, you know, doing their jobs in the drug scene, standover stuff, just – People were really suffering and these men were suffering in silence and just, you know, no avenue to talk about these kind of things. And we touch on it as well with police officers about PTSD, the stuff they have to see. So I think it's a really interesting point, especially when you talk about men's mental health, you know, and the suicide rate, just that space to be able to feel like you can acknowledge that you're struggling. James was saying he used to have guys that'd be doing a job. He said he found guys would open up to him. They were struggling with feelings of fear and a lot of drugs and alcohol self-medicating in that way. Yeah, I guess with us, it was like the same way that commandos spoke about it in the sense that throughout the first few years when you're coming up, you learn to desensitize to any thought pattern that might give you a moral compass. So by the time you are involved in serious crime or on missions or doing quite aggressive standovers you're so desensitized to any thought pattern that everything is just off impulse and you don't care about anything you just do and the most successful or the most violent or the most brazen criminals have no critical thoughts interrupting what they're about to do it's purely 
impulsive and ruthless. Is there a toll, though, or an eventual toll? Yeah, well, it's like the commandos, they come back, but the toll, it, it's got a bit of a lag to it. So you need something to trigger that PTSD, they might call it or whatever. And then it slowly creeps up. And the more you distance yourself, the more it preys on you. Yeah, people do suffer from it. I mean, all you got to do is go to a prison visit and talk to people once they've had time away from the gear, away from the drugs to really think about shit they've done. They're all suffering and they're openly suffering. And the prison environment doesn't help it at all. It makes them worse. So you mentioned you've got friends and some family members in prison. Do you in a way mentor them through things or you're just there as you know, I'm here for you? Were they involved as well with the kind of life you were living or? Yeah, you don't even need to mentor them. After they do five years in a prison like Barwon, they know, they, they realise what they've done wrong, but it's incubated in there. You can't escape it. You're just with people that are propelling these ideas. Again, it's the masquerade that you do on the street. It's the same in prison and you just, you've got an image to uphold and everyone's looking for a reason to judge you. And so you have to keep up this brave face. But when their family members visit them, bollocks that are all over the papers for committing multiple murders or they'll break down in front of you, they'll tell you how they really feel. And yeah, it's a complicated thing, but yeah, it definitely does damage them. And that's why they turn to drugs and they smoke ice because it's a momentary escape and it derails their thoughts from suffering to pure impulse. What did you find the typical background to the young men who were joining the clubs when you joined? You said that you were an unusual candidate because of your education. What was the typical new member? There isn't really a typical, just purely in our club, there wasn't a typical recruit. It all varied. Some people just got out of prison. Some people never been in prison. They just love motorcycles. But the people that wanted it for the wrong reasons, they got weeded out very quickly. You know, you can act a certain way and have this brave face and showboat. And when you've got a prospect for 12 months, you get found out real quick. If you act a certain way, if you try to be macho in a room full of men who are who are a lot tougher than you, it'll get sorted real quick. If you go into to an environment like that, acting like you're bulletproof, they'll throw you into an environment where you'll be tested and they fold very quickly. I've seen guys that are roided, look like Arnie, fresh out of fucking... I don't know. You can look like that and have tattoos all over your head and I've seen those guys buckle the fastest. It's always the quiet ones and the guys that are just... You can sense it as a feeling where where you're in the company of real men, all these fake guys, they crumble very quickly and um, they don't last very long either. They wind up in prison on, you know, some bullshit charge. What are you working on at the moment? Still writing for Vice and working on putting out more podcast episodes and try to keep getting bigger and crazier stories, hopefully throughout the whole Asia-Pacific region, to kind of find out why people from different cultures wind up doing the same things and facing the same consequences. I think it's really interesting what you're doing. And I mean, I've seen stuff with other people overseas, like Ross Kemp doing his gang stuff, but I like your approach with things because you've had the lived experience. Yeah, I get criticised a lot for being biased, but... We're all storytellers, aren't we? And you've got a really important story to tell, and that's the best we can do. Yeah, I feel like, you know, people have written about crime for so long, but nobody's written about crime from the inside and giving the criminals a platform to voice their opinion. And that's by and large the main reason why I wanted to be a journalist because when I was in the club, there were so many bad reports and bullshit from a lot of bullshit was written about people I knew and we all just kind of let it slide and we laughed about it. But really it, it creates a toxic environment because other people would read these bullshit reports in the papers and react off them. And that's what the media doesn't quite understand, that when you criminals don't really talk to the media, but they all read and consume the media. And if something gets reported about someone attempting to murder someone or allegedly attempting to murder someone, people are reading that and they react off that because they're very paranoid 
and they're very insecure. So if it gets badly reported, and it does a lot of the time, and it still does a lot of the time, there's severe consequences. And I'm talking people get buried. It's a really good insight to hear that, though, because I've been a journalist. You know, I, I read stuff as well. I mean, we're producing <laughs> journalism here, but yeah, the power of words. And I think it was James again, he said, he reckons that criminals are the biggest, he calls them gigs, like gossips out. They all love talking to each other. That's all it is. What's happening? Yeah. It's and he- all just a big gossip. But yeah. did your family read it and people outside of that world, did they read it and become influenced by it? Everybody gets influenced by it. Motorcycle clubs go to war because of it. And it's just bad reporting. It's just flaky sources. I don't know who their sources are and how they verify their sources and what, how they verify what their sources are saying because some of it is just absurd. We've had conspiracies where we believe the police were involved in leaking bad information to journalists and then a war breaks out on the street and people get murdered. 